Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is a solved one and it does involve domestic violence, but I do think that this case is pretty interesting because in order to solve it, the Canadian police actually used a pretty controversial sting operation called Mr. Big. I think it's so interesting how this entire thing played out and how it worked and I'm really looking forward to what you guys all think about this case and the tactics that they used to solve it. But before we get into the case, I need to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Thrive Market. Thrive Market is a membership-based online grocery store whose mission it is to make healthy living easy and accessible for everybody. You can shop for your organic foods and natural products all at traditional retail prices. They have such an amazing selection of groceries, supplements, snacks, non-toxic beauty items, eco-friendly cleaning supplies, personal care items, kids products, pet products, wine, meat, seafood, frozen food, and so much more. Their website makes it so easy to find exactly what you are looking for. You can filter their catalog by your diet, product types, or even your favorite brands. Whether you follow a gluten-free diet, keto, vegan, vegetarian, you can find over 90 diets and values that suit your lifestyle. I got myself some cheese balls, some white cheddar chips, an ice cube tray, and even a nail polish and cuticle care set. My friends and roommates have been so obsessed with my snacks. I actually had to tell them to chill on my snacks because I needed to have some leftover to show you guys. If left up to their own devices, I would have no snacks left. Thrive Market literally has anything you could possibly need from the grocery store delivered right to your door so you can shop for everything that you need in one place without ever leaving the comfort of your own home. Plus, you are guaranteed to save money because if you find a better price on a product elsewhere, they will match that price so you are always getting the best deal. They also have tons of membership options. You can get their monthly membership for only $9.95 or you can get their annual subscription for only $59.95, which comes out to $5 a month. So if you want to get your organic and natural products all at affordable prices delivered straight to your front door, make sure you join Thrive Market below and you will get 30% off of your first order, plus a free gift worth up to $50. So again, that's thrivemarket.com and you will get 30% off of your first order, plus a free gift worth up to $50. Thank you again so much to Thrive Market for sponsoring today's video. So with that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Aaron Chorney. Aaron Kristen Chorney was born September 30th, 1983 to parents Darcy and Debbie Chorney in Brandon, Manitoba in Canada. She had two younger siblings, her brother Ryan and her sister Leslie. Her parents did get a divorce when she was a young adult, but she was close with both of her parents and spent an equal amount of time with each parent. Aaron was known to have a very easygoing personality with an ability to make friends with just about anyone wherever she went. She was also very active growing up, participating in sports such as racquetball, baseball, and volleyball. She also loved the outdoors. She loved nature, with two of her favorite hobbies being camping and fishing. At the same time, Erin was known to be very stubborn. She was set in her ways, and she didn't want to budge. She had also struggled a lot with mental health issues such as an eating disorder and bipolar disorder. When she was 14 years old, she did attempt to take her own life. She spent a few days in the hospital and then voluntarily admitted herself into an inpatient treatment center for youths. She was there for three weeks before she ultimately escaped by jumping a wall. Growing up though, she had a lot of different aspirations. She thought of being a writer, a lawyer, or a counselor. She really just wanted to stand out at the end of the day and she just wanted to make a difference. Her parents described her as being outgoing and she was getting to the point of her rebellious stage. She definitely gave her parents a run for their money. It got to a point where she just always wanted to be with friends and she went to parties every so often. At first, it was just a normal teen rebellion and it wasn't a huge issue until she started hanging out with the wrong crowd. She started partying more and was partaking in using weed and alcohol more often. It did get to the point that she started skipping school very frequently until she dropped out of high school altogether. By age 18, she went to a drug treatment program to help deal with her substance use. That same year, in 2001, Aaron had met a man named Michael Bridges. 
At the time, Michael had actually been dating one of Aaron's friends, Liz. So the night that they met, Aaron had actually met up with Liz and Michael at a bar, and that's when she met Michael. That night, Liz and Michael had actually started arguing to the point that Michael had actually stormed off. So Aaron followed behind Michael and asked him what was wrong, and she basically gave him somebody to vent to. After this, Michael and Liz broke up, and him and Aaron realized that they seemed to get along pretty well, and they seemed to have a lot in common. So by 2002, the two started a relationship. So let's go back a bit and talk more about Michael's life. So Michael was born in 1980 to his parents, Brad and Georgian, who did ultimately become separated. So he grew up primarily living with his mother, now, apparently, Michael's dad's side of the family was pretty religious, and his parents were not together when Michael was born. So, Michael's dad's side of the family more or less kept their distance from Michael, I guess because they thought that he was like a bastard child, so they didn't really want much to do with him. Growing up, Michael had a best friend, who he used sort of as his confidant and his other half. But when he was 13 years old, this friend did ultimately pass away from cancer, which is obviously such a difficult and tragic thing to have to go through, especially when you're that young. After this, it seemed that Michael started to keep to himself and he didn't really talk much to anybody. Then when he entered high school, he started doing it pretty poorly and then he did ultimately drop out as well. After this, Michael pretty much just jumped from job to job and he was never really able to keep a job for too long. He also enjoyed spending his time outside and he really liked hanging out with his friends and partying. He was also one of those men who enjoyed playing the field. He saw himself as a player and he would often brag about how many women he could bag. By the time he started dating Aaron, he was still living at home home with his mother and his younger brother. I do also want to note that he seemed to have a pretty dominant personality. He liked to take control, so he kind of had control of his household and his mother was pretty passive and pretty much just let him do whatever he wanted. I will get more into this in just a bit, but now let's go back to Aaron and Michael. The two had dated for a couple of months before Michael had met Aaron's parents, and when he did, they described him as being nice and polite. Friends of Michael also said that he did not act in his usual way with Aaron like he did with most other women. Now, like I said, he was a player who didn't really seem to care much about the women he dated, he didn't really respect them, other than just bragging about how many women he can get with, but it was different with Aaron. Friends said that he was infatuated with her and he seemed to have genuine feelings for her. But as the relationship went on, Aaron's parents would find out more and more about a lot of things that were happening in the relationship behind the scenes. Aaron confided in her dad that Michael had been jealous, possessive, and very controlling. She told him at one point that he wasn't overtly violent, but he would break her stuff and act sort of aggressively towards her. But of course, as it does in so many of these relationships, his behavior got worse and worse to the point that he was verbally and physically abusing her. Her friends started to try and warn her to stay away from Michael, but at first, she did not see what they saw. Aaron's friends started to notice that he would follow her, and sometimes he would call her over and over and over again, and he would get really pissed off if she didn't answer any of his calls or if she just didn't answer right away. Then, things escalated from there. By March 10th, 2002, Michael, Aaron, and one of Aaron's friends, Lindsay, all went out drinking and they returned back to Michael's house at around 3 to 4 a.m. At some point in the morning, Lindsay had fallen asleep, so Michael and Aaron went into their bedroom to continue drinking. However, after a couple of hours, so around 6 a.m., Michael was very intoxicated and him and Aaron started to have a really intense argument, which turned into a really bad physical altercation. Michael grabbed Aaron by the throat and pinned her down and started strangling her with both hands. Aaron fought him and tried to get away, and even though she couldn't physically get away from him, she did cause enough commotion to wake up Lindsay. Lindsay heard what was going on, and she came into the room, and she actually confronted Michael by punching him in the head, and out of pure shock and startle, he stopped what he was doing for long enough for Aaron to get herself free. But at that point, he had turned his anger towards Lindsay, and he punched her in the stomach several times. 
Then Michael's mother had actually woken up from all the commotion and she intervened. She yelled and yelled and yelled until she got Michael to stop. And at that point, Michael told his mother that Aaron and Lindsay are actually the ones that attacked him. But obviously, they told his mother that he's the one that instigated all of this. So Michael's mother drove both Lindsay and Aaron to Aaron's dad's house, where he was also informed of what had just happened. They did want to file police reports for what had just happened, so Aaron's dad drove the both of them to the police station. They each gave their statement of what happened to the police at the station, and in Lindsay's report, she actually said that while Michael was strangling Aaron, he said that he wanted to kill her. So Michael was was arrested and charged with assault causing bodily harm, but he was only in jail for two days before he was released on bail. After being released, unfortunately, Aaron did continue to see Michael for a couple of weeks, but as you can expect, their relationship just continued to get worse and worse and things grew more and more violent. There was one instance where she was over at his house and when it came time for her to want to go home, he got really, really mad to the point that he shoved her out of the door and then he locked the door in the middle of winter so that she couldn't come back in. And at that point, she had only been in her t-shirt and underwear. So obviously she was freezing and stuck outside in the middle of winter and she was out there for quite a while before Michael's mother had noticed and finally let her back in to the house. Then there was another night where Aaron was with Michael and his friends at a bar and then the two got into an argument once again and it got to the point where he was dragging Aaron out of the bar and it got so violent that the bouncer had to interfere and he kicked Michael out of the bar. Then in yet another instant, Aaron had been out to eat with her dad and then Michael just showed up out of the blue and then he became upset with her and they started Started fighting, but Aaron's dad was actually able to calm things down and the two left the restaurant without any further incident happening. After all of these incidences, when she realized that it was just going to keep happening and happening and happening, Aaron finally decided that enough was enough and she broke it off with Michael. For a while, things seemed to be looking up for Erin after she split up with Michael. She was making some money, working part-time, she started going to the gym, and she spent a lot of time with her friends, and she had been partying and drinking a lot. But as she got more and more back into this partying lifestyle, there were times where she would end up staying at friends' houses for two to three days at a time while they were partying. So even though she did still live with her parents, they knew that there were times that she may not return home right away. But even though Aaron had separated herself from Michael and she finally felt free from him, he was not about to let her go so quickly. On one night, on April 18th, 2002, Aaron had been at a friend's house and she was partying, and when it came time to leave the house, she walked outside and she saw Michael's car out there before he just sped off. Then, three days later, on April 21st, Aaron had just got done with three days worth of partying with her friends, and of course, she was tired, so she just wanted to spend the day at home relaxing with her family. She hung out with her mom and her younger sister Leslie and they just laid around and watched movies that day. As they were getting ready to have dinner that evening though, Erin received a phone call which she answered but she was only on the phone for a few minutes before she hung up. Then the phone rang again and after that same thing happened. She answered and then hung up shortly after. Then she got a third and final phone call which she answered again. After this phone call, she hung up and then she told her mom that her friends were coming over and she was gonna go hang out with them and go get coffee together, but she said that she would be back home in about an hour. So as she left, Leslie followed her to the front door to lead her out. Leslie then watched as Aaron leave, getting into the back seat of a four-door sedan while two others were sitting in the front seats but Leslie was unable to see who the people were that were in the car with her. After this, hours passed and Erin did not come home like she was supposed to. Of course, her family noticed that she didn't come back, but they weren't too concerned because like I said, there were times that Erin would leave and she would say she was gonna come home that night, but then she wouldn't come back for, you know, a day or two at a time. Then by 2 a.m. on April 22nd, Erin called her 16-year-old brother Ryan and in this phone call, she did sound intoxicated and she asked him to come and pick her up. This was a pretty normal thing for Erin to do. She would call Ryan and ask him to come pick her up and most of the time he would. 
However, on this day, Ryan said that he was busy, he was talking on the phone with another girl that he was interested in, and he also just didn't want to be up too late because he had school the next day. After that, the call was ended, he didn't end up giving her a ride, and he hadn't heard from her again the rest of that night, or I guess the morning. So, like I said, when Erin didn't return home that night or the next morning, her family wasn't too concerned. But as hours passed on April 23rd and Erin still hadn't reached out to any of her family members at all, they did start to get a little bit worried. Normally, when she would go out like this, at some point, she would tell her family where she would be, or at least, you know, they would be able to get into contact with one of her friends and they would tell her where they were. But this time, she literally just told her parents that she was leaving to go get coffee and just didn't come back and she never said anything after that. So Erin's mother, Debbie, had started calling around to different friends to see if anybody had been with her or had seen her in the past couple days, but nobody had. Debbie also called Erin's dad, Darcy, to see what they should do. And at that point, they decided that they should wait. They didn't want to get police involved too soon because this was a pattern of behavior. Plus, she was 18 years old, so they knew that the second that they reported her missing, police would just say that, you know, she's 18, she's probably out partying, and she'll be home in a couple of days. And everybody in her family truly did believe that she would return home, but she didn't. April 27th came, and still nobody had heard from Erin, so her parents did go to the police station in Brandon, Manitoba to file her as a missing person. They emphasized that Erin had taken medications for her mental health issues, and they were worried because she hadn't taken it with her. They also said that she didn't have any money, any of her credit cards, or any of her other personal belongings with her, so there was no way that she could still be out there just living her life without any of her things. They also said that they were worried because they thought that she was last with her ex, Michael, who had just assaulted her in the month prior. So when police started their investigation, they went around and started talking to Aaron's friends and family members of Aaron, who all told them about her habit of going out, partying, drinking, and being gone for days at a time. So of course, initially, police thought that maybe this was the reason that she was missing, but as the days passed, this theory seemed less and less likely. Then as police were questioning those who knew Aaron, they started telling them about Michael and Aaron's relationship, about the assaults, about how he would act controlling, manipulative, and aggressive towards her. They told police that she had just broken up with him, but even after doing so, he continued to follow her and harass her. Then when police actually looked into Michael, they found out that just the day prior, so on April 26th, he had actually pled guilty to two counts of simple assault in relation to the charges that Lindsay and Aaron had pressed against him. He was ordered to have no contact with either of them, he had to do some anger management classes, and he had to do some community service. They thought that this was weird though, that he pled guilty to these charges right after Aaron went missing. So going off of all of this information, police brought Michael in for questioning. He told police that on the evening of April 21st, 2022, he was in fact with Aaron. He said that he had picked up Aaron that night after calling her those three times, and then they went back to Michael's house where they could be alone because Michael's mother and brother were out of town at that time. He said that when they got there, the two had a largely unremarkable night. He said that she gave him a haircut, and then she gave him a massage, and then she told him that it was time for her to go home because she had to work the next morning. He said that she left his house at around 11 p.m. that night and then started walking on foot, but she didn't mention to him where she was going. He said this was the last time that he had seen her and he hasn't heard from her since. Then police asked him why he pled guilty to those two charges of assault right after she went missing. And he explained that he just wanted to get over the whole thing. He said that he wanted to move past what he did and he wanted to work towards being friends with Aaron. He then mentioned that he was worried about her because he had actually seen her doing cocaine with some pretty sketchy characters in the days before she went missing. Michael said that maybe she really did just run off because she liked attention and she just wanted to get back at her parents but right away, police noticed that during this entire interview, he seemed very calm and collected and put together and 
everything that he was saying, it sounded very rehearsed. He also made the mistake of talking about her in the past tense. So just based on how he was talking and his body language, police really did think that he was lying. But all of their evidence was purely circumstantial, so there was nothing that they could actually do at that point. So they had to release him, and as soon as they did, he did get a lawyer. After this, police started searching Aaron's bedroom to see if they could find anything there that could point them in the right direction. Now, first, they did find a note that talked about that she wanted to die, but we know that she's had these mental health issues for a very long time, and we don't know exactly when this note was written. We don't know if it was right before she went missing or if it was in the months or years beforehand. But then they did find a journal where she wrote about how Michael had this evil side to him, but at the same time, nobody was able to love her the way Michael did. She wrote that she felt bad for reporting him for assault, but she knew that he tried to kill her at that time. She knew that he wanted to hurt her. She was in pain and she knew that it was what was best for her not to see him. But at the same time, she said that deep inside, she really did miss him and she wished things were different. Then police also found a letter in her journal that she addressed directly to Michael. She once again addressed Michael and said that she didn't want to report him, but it was the right thing to do. She wrote that she wanted to be with him, but he ruined it by hurting her. She said that she knows that she shouldn't love him, but she still does. But no matter how she feels, she will never let him treat her that way ever again. So of course, this really does show the emotional and mental state that Aaron was in. She was clearly struggling. She was clearly grappling with her feelings for Michael while also knowing that he hurt her and he was not what was best for her. So the more police investigated, the more they found out about Michael. So one of Michael's friends who is also named Michael, so I will call the friend Mike, but he spoke with police and he said that before Aaron's disappearance, Michael had asked him to call Aaron for him. This is going back to the three phone calls that we discussed earlier, but either way, Mike did call Aaron for Michael, but as soon as she answered, Michael snatched the phone away from Mike and he started talking to Aaron. During the first call, the two were arguing before he hung up shortly after. Then he called her again and the two spoke once again before the call ended. Then as we know, during this third phone call, that is when Aaron had agreed to meet up with Michael. So the two went over to Aaron's house, so Mike and Michael, and they were driving Michael's mom's 1991 blue Ford Taurus. After picking up Aaron, Michael had dropped the friend off and then Michael and Aaron went on their separate ways. Now the friend Mike would go on to take a polygraph test to account for the story. And according to the polygraph test, he seemed to be telling the truth about the whole thing. Then as police continued to investigate Michael's other friends, they learned that multiple of Michael's friends had been asked by him to call Aaron for him and everyone denied until Mike finally agreed to. So we find out that according to Mike, the real reason that Michael wanted to hang out with Aaron was because Michael was trying to convince Aaron to drop the assault charges. He was pretty much trying to bribe her money so that she would drop the charges. So again, after finding out even more more information that pointed police directly to Michael, they brought him in for questioning once again. He continued to stay stoic and unemotional, and he denied any accusation that he was involved in Aaron's disappearance whatsoever. Michael told police that he was advised by his lawyer not to talk to anybody, so he stayed quiet, but once again, they still didn't have any physical evidence that showed that Michael did anything wrong. So they had to release him and they continued on with their investigation. Police continued to gather tips and follow any leads that they could. There were several sightings of people who thought that they saw Aaron and they were also followed up on, but none of these leads or tips ever panned out and things were just getting really, really frustrating for the police. The only leads that ever took them anywhere were all just bringing them directly straight to Michael. So they started surveilling Michael and following him around and hoping that he wouldn't notice so that maybe he would lead them somewhere. Then they were able to obtain a search warrant for Michael's mother's car since that was the car that Aaron was known to last be in. 
So they actually made a key so that they could enter the car and search it discreetly. So basically what they did was they searched the car in the middle of the night by taking it off the property. And, you know, obviously they didn't want Michael to know that they were investigating him still at this point. So they were able to get the car off of the property, search it, and then return it without Michael knowing. But unfortunately, after the search, they still did not find any evidence in that car. So they continued searching and they ended up searching on the outside of Michael's mother's property. So not within the home, but the land on the outside. And this time they weren't so discreet. They made their presence known. And honestly, they were trying to see if Michael would come out and help with the searches to see, you know, just how much this man wanted to find his missing ex-girlfriend who he claimed to love but of course he didn't offer any help. Unfortunately, they didn't find any physical evidence on the outside of Michael's mother's home. So they did get a warrant to search the inside of the home to see if they could get any physical evidence in there. And once again, they did not. What they did find in Michael's room, however, was that he had kept a list of everything that he had told police about the night that Aaron went missing. Clearly he wrote this list to try and keep his story straight. So this obviously isn't exactly what they wanted, but it was something and it definitely pointed towards him lying. Obviously, if you're telling the truth, you don't need to make a list of everything that you said to keep it straight because it's just in your head. You know what happened, so clearly he was lying about something. They also went ahead and searched Michael's dad's property, but once again, they did not find anything there. So next, police were actually able to bug Michael's phone, but after doing so, he had actually stopped using his phone completely for an entire week, so they thought that maybe he was catching on to them tracking him. They kept putting forth their best efforts, but for months, absolutely nothing was found, and the case was at a standstill once again. Then, by spring of 2002, Aaron's parents had actually received a letter from somebody who claimed to know what happened to Aaron. The writer of this letter said that he was sorry for what he did. He said that he had actually tried to dig up Aaron's body from where he originally buried her, but he was unable to. Obviously, the letter was anonymous, so police tried to get DNA and or fingerprints from the letter, but they were unable to. Then another letter was found in a public restroom. Once again, the letter was written by somebody who said that they're sorry, and they actually said that a friend had urged them to contact police, but they couldn't. Once again, police did not know who wrote this letter, but they did get this idea to put out an ad in the newspaper directed at this writer in hopes that this person would write a third letter to police. And it worked. He wrote the third letter, and in the letter, he said that he knows that Aaron is still buried where he left her. He said that police were very close to finding her, and this was obviously very frustrating, but this did ignite a new search into Aaron's case and trying to find her, and clearly someone was out there taunting police. Someone was clearly out there checking in on the spot that they had buried Aaron, so this definitely lit a fire under their tail to go and actually find her. Now, at this point, I'm sure you are very frustrated that police aren't able to find anything that is connecting Michael to this crime when it seems almost obvious that he is the one responsible. Well, police felt the same way. They discussed any strategy that they could use from here on out, and by 2003, they decided that they were officially going to use the sting operation called Mr. Big. So, Mr. Big is a police procedure used pretty much only by the Royal Mounted Canadian Police. This tactic is controversial and it isn't used in the US or Great Britain. This is pretty much a last ditch effort to try and get charges against someone who they believe committed a crime. So essentially what happens is a cop will go undercover and they'll befriend the suspect and try to get close to them and build trust with them. Then the cop will eventually say that they're involved in some sort of criminal organization. So once this relationship is established, the undercover officer will start asking the suspect to do, you know, different tasks for them so that they could eventually join this criminal organization. Most of the time, the person who initiates this relationship isn't the person who the suspect is going to confess to. There's this motivation of making money 
and moving up within the ranks of the organization until they get to meet the leader or the boss of the organization who they refer to as Mr. Big. This person will then tell the suspect that they need to confess to any crime that they have done and in exchange for their dirty laundry, they'll be given some sort of position within the organization because obviously you need to say what you've done to earn your spot, I guess. Many of these conversations are recorded and they are allowed to be used in a court of law. So if someone is caught up in all of this and they admit to a crime, they can use this entire thing to convict them. This is controversial because one, some see it as entrapment, Plus, it takes a really long time, it costs a lot of money, and there is a huge risk of somebody making a false confession. It's not out of the realm of possibilities that someone would just make up a crime that they committed so that they could get in with the gang. So, it's understood that if someone is going to use the Mr. Big operation, they need to be confident and it needs to be carried out perfectly. For Michael, they needed to go off of what they knew he liked most, that happened to be sports and attractive women. So on September 22nd, 2003, an attractive female officer went over to Michael's house and delivered a flyer to participate in a radio survey. She said that if he participates in the survey, that he will be entered into a drawing to win tickets to see a home game for the Calgary Flames hockey team. Of course, he filled up the survey and he was contacted a few days later to let him know that he had won. So, of course, he went to the game, and then at the game, there were several other individuals who had won tickets, but really, they were all undercover officers. There was one male officer in particular who he really started to get along with and started hanging out with. After the game, they ended up going to a strip club together, and then in the days that followed, they continued going to bars together and strip clubs together, and they started to become friends. As things were going on, the officer had slyly made some mentions of being involved in a criminal organization, which of course, Michael did express interest in being a part of. So the officer started giving him small tasks to complete for the organizations, and Michael continued to comply with the tasks. Then he started to meet more and more members of the organization and in total, there were over a dozen officers who were all involved in this entire ruse. For their safety, I believe none of these officers' names have been released, but there was pretty much just this one officer who sort of had this relationship with Michael the entire time. So I'm just going to call him the officer. As things progressed, and obviously this officer knew that Michael was not afraid to do some illegal things, the officer actually staged a fake beating of another female officer as Michael watched. They made it look really intense and severe, and they were just trying to see how Michael would react. They told Michael that this is what happened to people who lied to them. They also sort of used this as a window to get Michael to open up and start talking about his violent tendencies that he had towards women. After staging the beating, the officer asked Michael what he thought, and Michael said that he would have done the same thing. He also told the officer about the past assault charge that he had with his ex-girlfriend, but he was really vague with the story, he wouldn't say her name, and he also wouldn't give details to what exactly happened. All he said was that, you know, she was this crazy ex-girlfriend, but she moved far away and so they didn't really see each other anymore. He also was avoiding any leading questions that they were asking that, you know, could pinpoint to exactly who he was talking about. After three months had passed in this entire thing, the officer told Michael that he really had a chance to move up in this organization. He told Michael that he really just needed to be honest with their boss, so in this case, Mr. Big, about any criminal activity that he had done in the past because Mr. Big can make it all go away. All he had to do was be honest. There was even one point where they had showed him how they doctored a security video at a casino in Winnipeg to provide a murder alibi for another gang member. All of this was to show that they could do a lot of things to get Michael out of whatever he was involved with. So by January of 2004, the undercover officer continued to hint towards Michael that whatever he did in his past, it didn't matter. All he needed to do was be honest. And Michael gave in. Finally, Michael had confessed bits and pieces to this undercover officer. 
He told the officer that he had killed a girl in his past, but it was an accident. So he explained that the two had started arguing, but she became really pushy and the argument became physical. He told the officer that he ended up pushing her to the point where she fell and hit her head on the table and then died as a result of her injuries. So after she had died, he said that he took her clothes off and threw them in the trash and then he wrapped her hands and feet and head with a plastic wrap and the rest of her body with a white flat sheet. He said he then went to the cemetery where his father worked and he dug up the grave that belonged to somebody else who was freshly buried there. He then transported the girl's body in his mom's car and then buried her two feet down into the grave. He explained that he buried her face up and that he carefully measured her body and made sure that she was perfectly centered in the grave and made sure that it looked like nobody had messed with the ground. So the officer convinced Michael to take him to the cemetery to show him where this girl was buried but Michael actually could not remember exactly where she was or the name of the person whose grave they used. So the next day, this undercover officer met with Michael once again, and he continued to emphasize that the more information that he was able to tell them, the better of a chance he had that Mr. Big would be able to get rid of this. So this actually got Michael to confess even more. He said that the two got into a fight about these assault charges that his ex-girlfriend had filed against him and things turned physical. He said that he grabbed her neck and choked her until she fell unconscious, but she hadn't died yet. So he dragged her body into the bathroom, filled the tub, and then held her head underwater until she drowned. He then removed her clothes and laid her body in the tub, and he cleaned her up to get rid of any evidence that could be on her, and then he wrapped her body in a sheet and went to bed that night. Then the next morning, as he said before, he took her to the cemetery where his dad worked, and then he found a grave that had already been dug, and he placed her in that grave and then, you know, buried her there. He then said that he went home and he cut up her clothes and he started putting them in the trash gradually over the next few weeks so that by the time police arrived, all of her clothes were gone and they weren't all in one place. He said that he hid her shoes and her purse under the chimney in his house, but when police searched for them, they did not find them. Then he burned any of her other personal belongings that he still had, but still, even when he was confessing all of this, he never mentioned her by name. So even though they captured all of this on audio recording, they, you know, wanted to make sure that there was no possible way that Michael could say that, you know, that wasn't him or something that could happen. They wanted to make sure that they would get these murder charges to stick. So police started excavating the cemetery to see if they could find her body. They did this in the middle of the night as well so that Michael wouldn't just show up and see that they were digging for her and as they were digging, they were careful not to disrupt any evidence. February 11th, 2004, just after midnight is when they started their searches in the cemetery. Now, police had an idea of where to look because Michael had vaguely remembered the last name of the grave that he used. He wasn't exactly sure, but it sort of gave them a general idea of where to search. They actually only ended up digging three holes before they found something. They discovered a white sheet that was buried about two feet into the ground. After this, they brought in more archaeological tools to more carefully dig out these remains to make sure, again, that they didn't mess up any evidence. They were able to uncover these remains and they had been wrapped in garbage bags with the hands, feet, and head all wrapped in plastic wrap. Because of this, her body had actually been pretty well preserved, even though she had been buried there for about two years at this point. So, of course, they were able to confirm that the body belonged to 18-year-old Aaron Chorney. Of course, her body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy, and they did find bruising on her neck and her thyroid cartilage, but it didn't seem to be enough that her cause of death would be from strangulation. So, they thought that maybe her cause of death could be drowning, but again, nothing on the autopsy was able to, like, confirm this for sure. 
but based off of Michael's statements and what he said happened, they pretty much assumed that that's what her cause of death probably was. So going back to the day that they excavated the burial site, police used this as the perfect day to execute the final part of the Mr. Big plan. That next morning, an officer called Michael to set up to meet with him at a Fairmount Inn in Winnipeg to set up a meeting with Mr. Big. Once they got into the hotel room, the undercover officer had received a phone call from Mr. Big who said that he would be running a couple of hours late. So on the phone, Mr. Big asked Michael more about his story and he asked him specifically for the name of the girl that he killed along with the details of what exactly happened. This time he finally said it. He did say that the girl was in fact Aaron Chorney and he said pretty much all of the same details that he said before, adding a few details here and there. He did go on to say though that he never meant to kill her. He said that he really did just want to hang out when, you know, he first picked her up and that's why he invited her over. He said that the night started out as normal, but they actually started drinking and that is when they got into an argument. But he said that Aaron was actually the one who became physical first, so he grabbed her neck and he choked her. He said that he didn't really know how long he choked her for because, you know, he just had the adrenaline running through him at that point, but either way, after choking her, she was still breathing. She was still alive. So rather than just letting her live, he decided to kill her. He said that no matter what happened, whether she was brain dead or just injured, he was screwed either way and he was gonna be going to jail either way. So in that moment, he grabbed his mother's hair dryer and he wrapped the cord around Erin's neck and choked her more. He said he did that for about a minute, but it wasn't working. So he decided to drag her into the bathroom and he put her in the tub and held her head underwater until she died. This was a process that he said took about 20 minutes and he just left her in the bathtub before he went to bed that night. He said that the next day, he actually went to the cemetery where his dad worked to just talk to his dad and try to relax and calm down. But as he was leaving, that's when he noticed a freshly dug grave. So he went home, grabbed his shovel, and in the middle of the night, he returned back to the gravesite to dig it up. He said that it took him about an hour or two to dig two feet into the ground because the ground was pretty hard. And he also had to be careful to make it look like no one had messed with it. Over the days, weeks, months, and year that followed, he kept going back to the cemetery to make sure that her site hadn't been messed with and nobody had found her. As he was saying all of this, he continued to remain emotionless and he didn't show any remorse for what had happened. But I will say that throughout this entire thing, anytime he made a confession, it was reported that he was nervous. He would take a lot of bathroom breaks and he would often crack jokes and laugh uncomfortably. Then when asked, Michael went on to say that the reason that he pled guilty to these assault charges just days after she went missing was so that he could throw the cops off of his trail. Obviously this didn't work, it just made them suspicious, but that's why he did it. This time, after his confession, police had everything that they needed and this entire thing was caught on video. But for the time being afterwards, for a little bit after, they continued to wait in the hotel room and wait for Mr. Big to arrive. But Mr. Big never arrived. Instead, after four months of carrying out this entire operation, two officers went into the hotel room and they cuffed Michael. As they led Michael out of the hotel room, you could just hear the betrayal in Michael's voice. He said, just tell me one thing, is undercover cop a cop? Just tell me that. Is he a cop? Originally, Michael was charged with second degree murder. However, after reviewing the evidence, the charges were upped to first degree murder. So originally, Michael was being charged with second degree murder. However, after reviewing the evidence, the charges were upped to first degree murder. Like we said before, he said that he choked her out of rage and there was no planning in that. So that does constitute a second degree murder charge. However, he admitted that, you know, he choked her and then after he realized that she was still alive, he took her unconscious but still breathing body and 
he sat there and planned for a couple of minutes to try and figure out the best way to kill her. Then he tried one thing and it didn't work, so he took the steps to try something else until he officially killed her. It doesn't matter how long you took in planning to kill someone, if you intend to kill someone, and if you put any sort of forethought or planning into that, that's first degree murder. He actually tried taking a plea deal to a second degree murder, but that was rejected. So the case went to trial and he was being charged with a first degree murder and he pled not guilty. Of course, during trial, the prosecutor explained that Michael somehow knew everything about the murder, where she was buried, how she died, everything. And he had a motive. She wasn't about to drop these assault charges and he was about to get in trouble for them. Of course, the defense could not argue that Michael didn't kill Aaron at all because he literally led an undercover officer directly to her body. So instead, they were arguing for second degree murder. The defense said that Michael killed Aaron during a heated argument, so there was no planning with that. They also said that Michael's confession was exaggerated because he was tricked into confessing. This is a big argument that's brought up in a lot of these Mr. Big cases of, oh, he was just tricked into arguing. He didn't really know what he was saying. He was exaggerating to look better in the eyes of the person that he was confessing to. But he literally led an undercover officer directly to her body. He explained how he killed her and he explained why. So it's kind of hard to dispute anything that he himself had said. There were details that remain the same through all of the retellings of what he said happened. So it's clear that he killed her and it's clear why. Of course, the trial also brought forward all of the evidence that we discussed earlier. And after the trial, the jury went into their deliberation and they came back with a verdict of guilty of first degree murder and he was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Of course, he appealed his conviction and he said that he was entrapped by police who got him to admit to a crime that he did not do. Of course, this was rejected, but to this day, he says that he's innocent. He did have to go to anger management classes while he was in jail and he said that he wants to make amends with Aaron's family, but they want nothing to do with him. So in the end, thankfully, the family is left with some closure in the case. They got the answers that they'd been looking for for so long and the person responsible is behind bars. But I know that a lot of you guys will have a lot of different opinions on the whole Mr. Big operation, whether it's ethical or not. And I'm very open to having that discussion with you guys. In fact, I'm really excited to see what you guys think. Me personally, I do see both sides. I can see why someone would say it's unethical, but I also see why it works. So I feel like because of how long it takes, because of the amount of time and effort the undercover officer puts into getting to know the suspect, they probably would be able to tell if that person is just making something up. Because obviously we've seen in cases where police will have someone in this, you know, dark interrogation room and they'll be yelling at them for 12 plus hours at a time, telling them, you know, you're going to get the death penalty, you're going to get this and that if you don't confess until the person just confesses. And in some of those cases, I can see how someone will make a false confession because they literally just want to go home and they think that if they just give the police officer what they want, that maybe they'll show them mercy. But the Mr. Big operation is not just a one-off thing. They really get to know the person and their quirks and their habits and the way they talk and the way they do things. And in this case specifically, obviously Michael, you know, led the undercover officer directly to her body. I do think that with this case specifically, after learning about all of their failed attempts to get evidence and after they were only being led to dead ends, I do think that this was the only way to go. I literally have no idea how Michael was able to hide all of that evidence and make it so difficult to find anything, but somehow he hid his tracks very, very, very well. So I do think that if this operation wasn't employed, that he may not have ever gotten jail time or he may have been free for like 10 plus years before getting any jail time, which, you know, you killed someone. You don't get to deserve to live your life for years and years and years as the family is just desperately hoping for closure and trying to figure out what happened to their murdered loved one. Do I think that this operation is useful or ethical in every single case? No, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but in this case specifically, 
I think that it was necessary and I think it probably was the only way that they were going to get the answers and the justice that they needed. But I really want to know what you guys think about this entire thing. But that is all I have for today's case. Of course, my heart absolutely goes out to Erin and her family. She was only 18 years old when she died and she had so much more life ahead of her. People can judge Erin for staying with someone who abused her and continuing to hang out with him even after she pressed charges against him, but let's not forget that she was a teenager. She also had mental health issues, so when you're a teenager and then mix that in with dealing with depression or bipolar, you're bound to have a lower self-worth. You are bound to think that, you know, my life revolves around this person and that they're the only person that could ever love me because, you know, that's probably what they've told me. When you're 18 or just a teenager in general, and even if you are the most mentally healthy person ever, when you're that age, you think that your life revolves around your friends and your partner, whoever you're dating at the time. When you're in high school or early college, you think that any heartbreak is the most devastating thing in the entire world and you cannot just imagine, you know, how you're going to go on without that person. Person. That's just how your brain works when you're that age. So then mix that in with a lower self-worth. I can see how it would be really hard for Erin to let this person go if she truly believed, and it seemed like she did, if she truly believed that he was the only person who could love her. And she did know that he wasn't treating her right. So she tried her best to keep her distance, even though she did keep going back to him. But let's just give Erin a break. What happened to her is so truly tragic and she didn't deserve any of it and neither did her family. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you click the link down below and join Thrive Market and you can get 30% off of your first order plus a free gift worth up to $50. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.